And we are back at Off The Cuff Radio. Had to throw, had to throw on some joints right quick to get us set up. So, without further ado, we got to bring out the man of the hour. West Coast legend. Pioneer. My man, That's Big nice. CPO, the boss. What's going on, brother? How you doing, Eric? What's good, man? Got to give, give you a um, round of applause. Thank you, sir. Lady J, how are you? We doing good, my man. How about yourself? I'm good, yo. man. I'm still great right now. Yo, yo, Eric, I'm having some technical difficulties. I'm going to find my charge and I'm going to call right back. All right, then. All right. So how you doing tonight, bro? Oh, uh, man, I'm good. You know, I was... Um, for a while there, but I'm doing a lot better now, so your life is good. Yeah, man, we appreciate you taking time to join us, man. We want to take. Oh man, thanks for having me on the show. I appreciate it. Most <laughs> definitely, man. So we about to go ahead and get this started off the right way, man. We got to let people know, like, being from California, man. How is it, how is the climate any different from where you grew up? Like, is it different now versus how you came up? Uh, well, I guess it. <laughs> It's worse, <laughs> and, and you know it's it's um, you know it's it's a, there there are a lot more. I think people are a lot more. Uh, they they take game banging that kind of thing is it, it's fashionable now. It's like the thing to do, versus back then uh, it was something that was, you know, it was it it at least appeared to be for some a little more necessary, and now it's not. You know, now it really ought to be much more about education and, you know, just trying to get yourself away from that entire mentality. And so, I mean, so by that, in, in regards to is it different? Yeah, it's it's a little worse than it was then. And, you know, it's interesting, too, because I remember I said something the other day about how, you know, a lot of cats that been in the street game, they're trying to basically get out, and they're pretty much – Preaching positivity, but yet you see these guys today. They're they sign a record deals and all of a sudden become gang bangers. Oh my god! Yeah, <laughs> that's yeah, the most backwards thing I've ever seen. Uh yeah, yeah. Uh, I'll, I'll never forget uh, a cat used to hang out with us. Um, he was a friend of my brother's, and he hadn't hung out with us before. So he, I, I didn't know this until later, but he asked my brother. So what should I be like when I hang around? You know, I mean, what was you know what should I do? You know, should I be more you know aggressive, like more? Man, just be you. <laughs> I mean, you know, if that's not who you are, then don't do that. And that's what's happening in in the music industry right now. These people aren't. And I mean, and, and, and let me say this: I'm not. Um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? I'm not advocating gang banging or or, or or gangster mentality. But if that's not what you are, then don't portray that because what's going to happen is you're going to run across people. Who actually, that's not what they do. It's who they are, and those kinds of people with that type of mentality really don't appreciate people uh, perpetuating that and making money off of that if that's not who they are. And you know, you're running into serious problems. You know, you may you may not go home. So it's you know, this is who you are. You don't. I mean, it's it's one thing to talk about that and to you know speak on that if that's what you see, if that's been in your environment. Or, you know, I mean, you don't, you don't even have to grow up in that to, to speak on it. Nobody has freedom of speech, you know what I mean? But, you know, don't say I'm this, I'm, I, I don't, I'm so-and-so, I'm this, I'm that. No, if that's not who you are. And uh, so, yeah, I'm seeing a whole lot of fakeness, and that is irking me. Just be that's how you can tell that. That's how you can tell the game has really changed, brother. I mean, a lot of the stuff that I've seen, I'm seeing now, I knew would not exist in your era. No, it would. Oh my God! Um, uh, earlier, you guys spoke of somebody. You know, I guess I won't say names currently, but people kissing each other in the mouth—that does not happen. <laughs> <laughs> what is that? What are you wearing? What the hell is wrong with your hair? What are you wearing lipstick? What are you doing? I mean, just all this—it's—it's—it's—it's it's, 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 it's really different and ridiculous, you know. And it's—it. You know, you know, I, I'm literally shaking my head because I don't get it. And, and people are so quick to follow. I, you know, on, on Twitter you have so many 
followers or whatever, there's never been a more um, correct word to use because that's what I see happening in life. There's so many followers. Nobody, you know, nobody's charting their own course. Everybody wants to be like what they think, you know, is the thing to be. And it's, it's well, not everybody, but far too many people. And, um, you know, they're not charting their own course. They're not, you know, they're not being imaginative. They're not, I don't know, it's, 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 um, and it's, it's an endless loop. You know what I mean? So it's, um, yeah. It, it, it's like this endless loop of, of degradation. People don't want to. There's way too much negativity, not enough positive thinking. Uh, and I understand that people are being fed by things like, you know, what's going on with, you know, the, the police brutality and so on and so forth. But that, I mean, how do you think we came up with a song called it's like the police? That isn't a new thing, you know. It's just that now it's everybody's got a camera phone, and it's you know it's exactly. much more widespread. Facebook didn't exist back then, so everybody's like this. Oh my God, you're, they're appalled. Are you appalled now? Do you get it now? That's why we said fuck the police. That's the reason. Now you get it. Absolutely. So, you, know. you know, and a lot of people it, don't know is that you know you were heavily involved with NWA around the time. They was putting out 100 miles and running and, you know, niggas for life. Like, what was your involvement with them? Uh, I grew up probably literally, literally with Ren. Uh, Dre lived maybe three blocks away. Eric lived maybe three or four blocks away. Eric lived maybe two blocks away. Uh, the only ones I didn't know were Cube and Yella. Uh, you know, let me put a ribbon press in that you I didn't know he was. But, um, but uh, yeah, that's how we... Grew up and uh, you know the next thing I well I, I remember when Ren, not actually not Ren but I remember when Easy First came out and I remember when Dre went from being just a guy I knew in the neighborhood to Dr. Dre a DJ and the next thing I knew they had this group NWA. Um, I remember the first time I saw him at La Casa and I was like wow this is the homie you know they got a group and, you know and that's when Eric was doing that's when the Boys in the Hood was real big and it was just really cool to see people that I knew on stage and it was so funny to watch Eric getting all this you know, all this fanfare and he would just sit there and look like, Wow, they know the song and I was like, Yeah, yeah, you big, baby, y'all big and I had no idea that they would become the phenomenon that they did. So yeah, that's how people I don't understand. Like, you know, NWA were like treated like rock stars back then too. Yeah. Or now. I mean, you know, even Eric uh, rest in peace in his passing, he's He's at very least as big now as he ever was, you know. But um, you know, Ren signed me, and then being in the studio with them a lot, I got a chance to be on you know the Niggas for Life album and the Hundred Miles of Running album, and so that was cool. Yeah. Now, what what tracks were you on on on, on the um Hundred Miles and Niggas for Life album? Because a lot of people didn't even know. You know Hundred Miles of Running, they're just using excerpts with me. Um, right. Uh, actually, uh, in that song, but the song that I'm probably known for on Niggas for Life is Find the Fuck of a Fling, is Mr. Big Draws. So. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, my I can't God. imagine, because you know when I played the, the intro clip to the protest off that album, I know y'all used to get tons of heat for that, for that, for that album. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, you know, the, the thing is, uh, you know, for, it's for me, it was almost like, you know, being this this huge shadow of of uh, of NWA, which was a cool thing, believe me, being in that umbrella. But uh, well, I, you know, under that umbrella. But yeah, I mean, after that song, after Fuck the Police became so, you know, popularized, it yes. was a trip. You know what I mean? It's like I'll never forget one day, uh, Ryan and I. I was trailing him so we were on our way to a show and well uh, a, a movie show and um we got a felony stop out in the Hollywood area and I mean they had probably about 20 police cars a helicopter or two and had a felony stopped out laying in the middle of the street you know all kinds of shit and so it was um a trip fortunately we and Toby back then always keep something on you to identify who you are and I don't mean like ID I mean like a magazine or something with you in it. And I said, okay, cool. Well, he had a magazine with NWA on it. He was, you know, uh, 
in it, and he showed them that. And I had a source magazine, and I showed them that. They let me go. So fortunately wow. for me, I, and they immediately said, oh, you got a dear fucking place. He was like, yeah, you like that song? I mean, you know, in the end, it, it became <laughs> a thing of them sitting here talking to, you know, oh, I'm talking to one of those guys. You know, it wasn't, they didn't see us as just, you know, these, you know, they're, they're black people out here and they're doing it. Because they, they, what happened was Rand was driving his BMW, and they thought that he had stolen it and that I was a trail car. So I don't know who told them what. They must have seen us leaving the B and W um lot because Rain had gone to get his car detailed. So, you know, racial profiling was happening way back then. I'm certainly sure certain before that, but that was what happened to us. Somebody said, you know, I saw X amount of black guys leaving here, is there a black B and W, somebody's behind him in a red, blah, blah, blah. And so yeah, crazy. Man. Now around that time when you made the Hell in Black album. That's one of personally, that's mm-hmm. one of my favorite albums. Very underrated. Thank you, sir. What was like your creative mindset going in that album? Like you were not trying to be the best rapper mm-hmm. alive or you just looked Dude. at it like it was a good avenue to get on. In my in my very honestly speaking, I had no direction. None. Um somebody had started this Somebody was rapping. Another guy I know was DJing. I was hanging around them and um, trying to learn how to rap. I did not know how to rap. And so wow. I'm listening to them and trying to learn how. And, you know, Ren was doing it. Ren and my brother were doing it all the time. They were always, Ren and my brother is cutting a chip. Um, uh, they were always on the corner right in front of Ren's house rapping like every night clockwork. And, you know, I knew that. And I knew my brother was tight. I knew Ren was tight. I knew Chip was tight. But I didn't know how to rap at all. And um, so I was trying to learn how to rap, and I put on Funky Enough one day and rapped something to it and recorded it. And my brother heard it, and then I didn't know that Ren and were back off tour. Ren heard it and came over. He, my brother came over, told him to come over, and he said, yeah, I heard you rapping. And I said, no, I'm not. He said, yes, you are. I said, no, I'm not. He said, let me hear it. No, I wouldn't let him hear it. It was like... He was no longer Lorenzo to me. He was MC Ren of NWA now. You're a professional rapper. You're not hearing my shit. Uh, that's not going to happen. <laughs> and and so, you know, he's like, man, let me hear it. I let him hear it. And literally an hour later, we were in a studio re-recording the song. And that song was something like this. And uh, that day he told me, I'm going to sign you to a record deal. I'm like, what? So... <laughs> the next thing I know, I'm getting handed tracks to for a record deal, and I, well, I, I mean, you know, it it happened in really like that, and so I had no idea that that was going to happen. I had no direction, no nothing. I was just trying to finish the song, and that wasn't easy. That's so crazy, what you man. Hear, I know you had to probably be in the studio with Easy. He they tried to teach Easy how to rap, <laughs> and they and they said that was the most stressful thing ever. Stressful but funny, really funny. Uh, that's how I got on the Niggas for Life album because I was always in the studio every day pretty much with them watching them do what they did. I really wanted to see that project come together. And um, and then Easy would have me up there. Easy said, I want to learn how to stutter step rap. By that time, I had learned how. And he was like, I want you to teach me how to stutter step. I'm like, Eric, get out from stutter step, dude. You can do it. He's like, Man, teach me how to stutter step, Eric. You can't rap. You're not going to stutter step. And he was like, you know, Eric, it's like this. I would say, Eric, you what? And he would always say, I'm making money. That was his answer. I couldn't say nothing. <laughs> I could not say nothing. So, you know, we would sit there. I mean, it would literally take hours for him to finish a verse. But, I mean, you know, in the end, he would, he got it. You know what I mean? And um, he just, what it was was his personality, and he could, he could deliver it well, you know what I mean, and that's that's that was the thing about Eric. He just had that 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 character, that swag. So, he had that whole know, that whole that whole image. Yeah, I mean, well, that's who he was. He was Eric Kirk was you? not a studio. Yeah, Eric was not a studio gangster. Eric was a dude from the street. You know, he just that he took what he knew from the street and put it in song. So, you know, he just had a couple of folks around him. Usually ran and you know, few to 
guide him the way that he wanted to do it. So. Now, another thing I wanted to know is, this, and this was like a question a lot of people was curious to know, like, you know, after you went to Ruthless, you ended up on the Death Row soundtrack. You ended up on Above the Rim and Murder Was the Case. Mm-hmm. Uh, how did you end up over there after the roof was like? Did you get in the middle? Were you in the middle of that whole little feud they had? Okay. Actually, I wasn't. Here, here's a, the common misconception that I was signed to Rufus. I was never signed to Rufus. I was just with them all the time. Uh, I was signed to Ren, and we, all, you know, and I had the same manager as everybody had. It was Jerry Heller was my manager too, because he was Ren's and NWA's manager. So I was always with them. But um, I was actually signed to Ren, and Ren had me signed to Ruthless. I mean, I'm sorry, to Capital. Um, but after the first album, Capital wasn't really, they really didn't know how to move gangster rap. Uh, they were way too in the MC Hammer at the time. And uh, Ruthless already had NWA. Uh, and Death Row was a new upstart, and they were doing big things. And, you know, they had arguably the hottest producer in the world at the time, Dre, or at least in hip-hop, and uh, they had soup, you know, and I was invited to go there, I was invited to go to Rufus, and it came down to, you know, what team do you want to, you know, play for this year? You know, I'm thinking about a basketball game, so to speak, you know what I mean? So, you're a high commodity, so to speak, uh, I know you're talking to such and such team, we want to get with you too. And, I mean, you know, when you got kind of a Shaq and Kobe thing going on in Death Row, mm-hmm. you go to the Lakers. You know what I mean? So that's what I did. It wasn't a it's thing of really being caught up in. I had to do it. You know, it wasn't a thing of being. Everything they put out was going multi-platinum. You know, there was the deep cover soundtrack, the Snoop's album, the climate. I'm, I'm there. You know, there's, I mean, Dre said, listen, I'm doing this. I'm doing this soundtrack uh, for Above the Rim. If you want to get on, you can. Uh, there was no thought process whatsoever. Jumping on that, you know. And then there was murder was the case. And after that, you know, things start getting a little weary at Death Row. And, you know, I shook the spot. And after actually, after I shook, um, I just happened to call up there. I was still signed, but I wasn't trying to get studio time or anything like that. And one day, just out of the clear blue, I happened to call. And, you know, Tupac was there, and we ended up doing you were rolling and that's how that happened. Now, when I first heard that that track, the eulogy, that the production that alone was smooth. Then I noticed another thing too was you know you had like slight like a slight voice change. Like you had a more chill yeah. flow. Um, you know what? When I when I first started out, I was doing I was almost a battle rap kind of thing, rapping really loud and boisterous and that kind of thing. And somebody asked me, why don't you just kind of lay back and do, you know, that kind of style. But to be honest with you, what really probably drove that happening um, was that rap was beginning to change. And one of the people who was changing it then was Snoop. You know, he had this this laid back style and he was doing just kind of an easy laid back style. And it was suggested to me, why don't you try that? Because your speaking voice is a little different than your yelling voice. Try that. And that's where the eulogy came from. The, you know, stopping this yell thing and going into just more of a talking kind of thing. So, but, you know, everyone didn't like that. Everyone was like, why don't you do, you know, you don't bust no more. Okay, well. So, I mean, you can't please everybody all the time. You can only do what you can do. So, hey. It was a very cold, it was, it was a very cold-blooded track to me. And, I, and then Corrupt produce it. No, actually, my homeboy Sandman. Funny you kept saying your, your, your homie named Sandman. That was the same name of the guy that produced that for me. Um, uh, my buddy. So, uh, what happened was one day Corrupt came to the studio and asked if his uh, protege at that time, uh, um, Slip Capone, picked up on the track with me. And I had already heard Slip get down. He was tight. And I was like, Shit, man, put him in. And uh, Sandy asked, my boy Sandy, who's also Sandman, asked, Correct. Well, listen. Why don't you do the hook? You probably like cool. So that's how that happened. But I had always wanted to do something with the pound anyway. So that was mm-hmm. a really great thing to come together. It, a lot of the things that happened with me in this industry have been sort of an accident, but really cool accident. 
hospital, you know. Like taking advantage of every situation is given. Smart. That's good. That's good uh, for the guy. Not everyone. I really should have taken advantage of a few more, but some of the right ones, yeah. Now, what, now was those death row sessions were they as crazy as many people say they were? Uh, you know what I'm gonna tell you about me being in death row. My approach to doing music is that it's it's a business. It's a job. I don't like to go to the studio and hang out and chill and, you know, blah, 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 and just smoke, drink, all that kind of shit. When I go to the studio, I'm there for a purpose. My reason for being there is to do the song. When I'm done with my song, I shake. And that was just my process. So I was never really there when crazy shit cracked. Um, I won't say that I wasn't there getting my drink on smoke on. That's just part of my process, too. But um, all the things that were happening that get wound up in, uh, you know, in the media, which seemed to happen on days that I wasn't there or right after I left. Or, you know, I'd get a phone call at home like, you'll never guess what happened. What? What? What did that happen? You know, man, just about, oh, we'll go up like this. Damn. You know, so, <laughs> I, you know, I guess God was looking out for me and I was, you know, had me somewhere else, which is a good thing. That's a blessing in disguise, brother. They, they, I know it was some crazy madness going on around that time period. Yeah, it was. I, I tell people all the time, Deborah was a really interesting place to visit, but you might not necessarily want to live there. <laughs> the, name, the name alone so, spoke volumes on a lot of people. Uh, you know what? Uh, uh, strange you would say that. I remember telling my mother when I first uh was leaving Capitol and signed to Death Row. She said, why are you signed to a label called Death Row? And that always stuck in my head because it was kind of like this foreboding name. But, I mean, it was just propaganda. But at the same time, you have to watch the kind of spirit you, you know, you, you call up when you say certain things, you know. So I didn't want to be around death too long. And it was just a strange and uh, consequential thing that, people literally started to die. You know, I, I said to myself, that's that's not good. You know, this person's being killed, this person's being killed, I'm out. There was far too much of a street mentality um, um, element in the studio that didn't need to be at the studio, and that always, it, it was always some kind of tension in that respect. You know what I mean? It's like you got a gang of crips in the place, a gang of bloods in the place, and this was not banging on wax, per se. People here are not necessarily cool with, with one another. You know, everybody knows they don't come from the same hoods, and eventually things may erupt. So it was always some kind of tension. I mean, things didn't really crack wise like that in the studio, but, I mean, that that whole vibe, not necessarily too cool. Mm. Uh, they may have a... 757 caller. Let's see who this is. 757? Yo, what up, Eric? CPO. What's going on, man? What's going on, man? Uh, this is uh, T-Mac, uh, a.k.a. Southside of Shrews there from Facebook, man. Good to hear from you. Yes, sir. Hold on, one second. Yes, and Janine, I can't forget about you either, sweetheart. How you doing? What's going on, bro? Um, what's going on, man? Yeah, um, first off, you know, it's a it's a lot of. I mean, I gotta give y'all just kudos, accolades, and everything. I mean, CBO, you are one of the to me unsung pioneers and heroes of the West Coast movement. As you and me talked um, about a week ago, you're one of the bridges between Dre and Easy in terms of being a a witness to the evolution of West Coast hip-hop in its infancy from it going mainstream to where it is right now. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, pretty much from what you've observed over the years in reference to just the overall uh, the evolution of hip-hop as we know it from both sides, East and West Coast, um, where do you think things have kind of changed up in terms of where some artists, they've lost their vision for where, for what the culture stands for and what the music is supposed to represent in our culture. Um, you know, I was thinking one uh, one day about how 
you know, I remember when the West Coast first came into it uh, and started getting notoriety. Um, and then uh, Tommy did a song called Used to Love Her. And he was basically talking about how when it came, the way it left New York and got here, it started to pick up, you know, I guess negative things. And the, the thing is, we were just talking about what we knew. We were talking about what we would, what our lifestyle was like, what life living in, you know, L.A. and Compton and that kind of thing was like. It wasn't, it wasn't the same kind of uh, vibe as New York. It wasn't the same kind of lingo. Uh, and from our standpoint, it was more of a a, a pioneer kind of a thing. It, we were beginning to open the world's eyes to what was happening here. Versus now, what's happened is as a result of what we did back then, you have an entire generation that's been listening to that music and growing up on it. And what they're doing is, they're, in my opinion, they're trying to live what they hear in the music. Wow. And that wasn't the purpose in why we were doing it, you know. And as a result of them doing that, I mean, they heard us saying, <clears throat> you know, you know, like a number of bitches and money, and they ran with that. I mean, now you look at Everybody literally wants to be a gangster. You know, we were just speaking about that, Eric and I. And it's, and it's not because, you know, being a gangster is necessarily the shit. It's because they've come to believe that they are listening to this music. You know, I want to be that. Uh, I didn't necessarily know then that we were creating negative role models. But the negative role model was the music itself. It, it, it didn't, it wasn't meant to be that. We were just talking about us and what we did and what we knew and what we lived. But what they're doing now is living. It's like they, you know, wake up in the morning and they have a, they have a, they have an opportunity to do something else, but they don't want to do that. They want to do what they're <clears throat> hearing. And that's caused all kinds of different things to perpetuate themselves. Like, you know, you get on Facebook or something like that now, you see everybody's holding up gang signs and you know the language that's just degraded I mean degraded to a point it's like are you kidding me is that really how you're spelling that word <laughs> so uh, <laughs> you, you know women actually want to be seen call, they, they call themselves bitches and hoes now and I'm right, like right. what the fuck you know and when I stopped and thought about it I said well you know you guys might be have a little something to do with that you know, it, we accidentally glorified those, you know, those images. And so that's what's happening. That's what's happened as a result of that music. And it's, it's, it has a life of its own now. You know what I mean? So <clears throat> it's a trip. Yeah, man. Uh, I mean, for what you were saying, and I think Eric would agree with me on this as well, I think the paradigm shift. I mean, when you look at it from American culture and history in general, we have always, you know, from Al Capone to Frank Nitti, Meyer Lansky, mm-hmm. we've always glorified the rebels, the gangsters, those Very true. You know, the gang- status quo. Very and, true. And from the West Coast, in terms of, you know, like you said, the music was a reflection of what a lot of you, you know, um, a lot of you, of course, you know, not just relegated to yourself, but guys like, you know, you would know these guys, Cam, Mitchie Slick, Q, you know, E-Rule, all of those guys, so, Nate Dahl, right. Rest in Peace, so many of you were on the front lines of something that on the East Coast we had no real understanding of in terms of what it was. Mm-hmm. You know, as I look, you know, and I grew up around that time, you know, in terms of, in Virginia, you know what I'm saying? You know, um, so, I mean, but when you look at it now, like you said, you know, gang banging has become a fad. It's become certain unnamed artists. <laughs> Me and Eric go back and forth all this on the time who have decided to, quote, unquote, uh, set up, you know, without putting in the work, you know, who shall remain nameless. You know, to me, it, it is a... Um, you know, it, 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 it to me it cheapens the culture, and for something as rough and as real as game banging is, I have respect for those who have lived that life and are still here to tell us about the ills of. Like I said, 
which all we're doing was simply giving a depiction, a story of what was like in the hood. But it's like everybody's got it crossed up now, playing with something, you know, whether they blood skipping or, you know, pseudo blood skipping or seawalking, something that they really don't know the history of and the perils and the implications of that. I mean, Absolutely. They don't know. The, you, you could not have said that better. They don't know the implications of it. They don't know the history of it. Most unfortunately, they don't know the perils of But somebody figured out that all that was uh, marketable. You know, yeah. it's like I mean, uh, I mean, I put to you this way: Chuck Keys used to go for you can go buy a pair of Chuck Keys for like twenty some bucks. Now, now, now Chuck Keys are like you know, hundred some dollars, then the two hundred dollars leather ones and blah blah blah. You know, somebody saw um, you know a windfall of money that could be made, and they decided let's make money off this game stuff. That's really. I saw something. Somebody posted something the other day, or not the other day, but a few months ago, and. I, I guess you could buy it at Walmart, I think it was. And it was a it was for a kid and it was like a pair of pants that had a rag already tied in the back. I said, I was the Wow. I this had to be a West living. Coast Walmart of suck because we ain't got that in the I I was living. Living. Like that And I was like, Are you I mean and but you have to realize that's not somebody black came that came up with that. That oh, no, somebody no. in corporate America was like, you know what, they're they're wearing these rags. How about we just so one in the pocket for them. Well, well, well the colors? Uh, oh, oh, get a red one, get a blue one. No, don't do that. that. Like and I mean, it was, I mean, you know, it was, I mean, you know, oh my God. It's, it's, like I said, it's taking on a life of its own and it's, it's, it's really kind of sickening. You know what I mean? Because it's like, but I mean, it, and, and, and the actual person who game bang, who did it back in the day, who's growing up, uh, it isn't so much that they don't. I mean, they may not be active. Um, what they've done is they 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 matured. I mean, that that right. mentality probably still lays dormant in them, but they had the opportunity to live that life and then, fortunately, you know, come beyond it. Maybe had some kids, and now they they don't want their kids to grow up. At least some of them don't want their kids to grow up like that because they know the dangers of it. You know what I mean? It's not it's not cute. It is not a game. It's not funny. It's not fun. It's very real, you know. Um, it's as real as any as any other kind of danger in the world. And you know, I mean, even now, you don't walk up in somebody's neighborhood saying certain things wow. um, because you know you don't walk out. And, and I mean, it's you know, I, here's my thing about these out. certain unnamed yeah. artists who already become successful, and then the next thing you know, they're in videos and on you know and on. You know, pictures and taking selfies themselves, throwing up gang signs and blah, 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 blah. Dude, what are you doing? You have already become <laughs> successful. You've already made it. And now you want to go and hang out with people who have not. You want to go and hang out with the wrong crowd. What's that about? Chris Brown. <laughs> I, hey, I say, hey, you know, and I, he's not hardly the only one at all. I mean, you know, I watch people flip flop. I watch people go from being the crypt this week, next week they love. What the hell are you doing? What are you doing? You can't download a crypt app. Download it. That, that, that's not what, what is a crypt app. We don't download these mentalities. You know, so, you know they're working are. on that too right now too. <laughs> oh yeah, you know, and, and that's what I mean. It's 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 almost like it's, it's become like this AI. Like you know, it's, and it's it's I don't know, man. It, and uh, you know, I. I I, I guess I should probably apologize, but I mean, hey, it's 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 who we were, it's who I was, it's who I am. You know, it's just that I, I'm not just that. You know, right. I don't just use profanity. I don't just wear black. I don't just wear blue. I don't just wear. I don't just you know eat one food. I mean, it, it, it's it's a part of. It's one part of who a person is, uh, or Diversity. was, or whatever else. Exactly. So, uh, if, if anything, I would be condoning. Education because it's really kind of a. That's really, that's really Education is almost becoming a memory. Yeah, because at this point now it's like you know the gangsterism rap them went through that phase and now it's time you know we're judging by how you seeing artists like Kendrick Lamar and J Cole are doing numbers it's like people are you know yearning for more out of these artists. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, like they yeah. for more uh, substance. Uh, well, you know, I'll put it this way. It, 
I, I, I'm oh. gonna, I'm gonna. This is gonna sound maybe a little bad, uh, but uh, uh, the album that I'm working on now probably still does a lot of that stuff. You know, I mean, it, it. What can I say? Um, uh, I think when I, uh, my first album was in that time frame, you know, I was, you know, really big on KRS One and Chuck D and that kind of thing, and you know, I was really trying to move. I mean, you know, remember back then they were wearing like African, you know, necklaces and all that kind of medallion necklaces and all that, pushing that, you know, pushing that positive oh, yeah. black. Um, but things have changed over the years. I mean, my whole life has gone through different, you know, things over the years, and you know, dealing with people and dealing with relationships, and so I guess my album is this I've also album is more of a reflection of those things and it's also talking about the gang culture, it's talking about cops, it's talking about the same kinds of things, it's just that the difference is is that um, you know it's it's. I guess it's from the, from the standpoint of someone who's been through it now, you know right, uh, right, right. Not, just, not just trying to make a name for myself because that's what I was doing back then but actually Live the life, you know, raise a kid, and and so it's it's and not just a kid, a daughter. So that was a, a thing. A, wow, yeah, you, know, you really I got. I really, too. huh? Yeah, I think rap needs a little. I need needs more of that too because you know it's very rare that you know you have rappers actually rapping as family men or showcasing that growth. Everybody's still trying to be like teenagers, you know? Yeah. I think that's uh, why you know. I, Rap is having. Sorry, a, 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 I think that's why rap is having like a growth problem, and why it's still not appreciated. I you, think you know what? Uh, which is one of the reasons why I, I appreciate you guys having me on the show because it's you know it's um, it, it's good to kind of remember where you came from in, in in a way, and what's happening now is that people aren't doing that. I mean, I'm looking at I'm looking at parents, for instance, who aren't parents. They just had a kid, and that's it. They really aren't proper parents whatsoever. I mean, they do everything wrong around their kids. They let their kids, they will hand their kids something to smoke, hand their kids something to drink, drink and smoke around the kids. You know, back in the day when if drinking and cigarette smoking, whatever else it was, was going on around us when we were little, uh, we couldn't be in a room with the adults. You get out of here. You know, you go in the room, you all go outside and play. And that's how we were with our kids. But now I look at these, I look at these folks now. They in the house, and you know, they the women got the, you know, they twerking in front of their kids, and that's the what the hell are you doing? <laughs> you know. So I mean, it 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 starts in the home. It really does. And and the home is is tainted right now. There's, you know, uh, mothers and fathers are either. I mean, you know, it's one thing to have a father and or mother who isn't there. But it's worse to have them who, I mean, their, their bodies are there, but that's it. They're not actually doing anything. They're not trying. They're, not, they're making no attempts whatsoever. You know, their kids are just running rampant. That's it. So, you know, it's, just that, no one's, it's the simple fact that right. they're allowing the television to raise the kids. That too. The television and the music. That's what's happening. The music and the television is raising the kids. And so, you know, it's no one's trying to give anything. No one's trying to pass down any wisdom. No one's trying to, you know, curtail them from doing the wrong things. You know, don't speak this way. Don't wear those kind of things. Don't go out at this, to this place. Don't, you know what I mean? Just don't engage in, in certain things that are going to lead you to jail. And, uh, you know, it, 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 there's no push. So, it's a trip. And it doesn't help either. It matters that, you know, a lot of the people that the kids are looking up to are pretty much not the best role models in the world. Like, you know, when they see these guys wearing wearing skinny jeans and stripper boots and oh, makeup, oh. it's like, they're, they're like, well, my hero's doing it, so it's, it'd be hard for me. I'll put it to you this way. Um... Men, a lot of men are not men anymore, and vice versa. And it's become this thing, well, I mean, as long as the person's happy, no, no. 
So, my son, that's the worst argument if I had a son, would we'll, we'll not be being happy uh, playing with dolls, and would we'll not be being happy in high heels, and would we'll not be being happy wearing lipstick. We're going to stop that and nip that in the bud. You don't, you know, that's the girls, they do that, and you don't do that. Um, but that's not the case now. You know, well, if that's what he wants to wear, are you effing kidding me? Really? You're supposed to be guiding that that child. You know what I mean? You don't let them do what they want to do. They don't know what to do. They're children. <coughs> and that, that children's mentality, you know, it's still there. And it's, you know, still my adult body. So it's like people haven't grown up. Like you said, there's no, there's no growth. You know what I mean? And I, I'm, I'm certainly not talking about everyone. You cannot put that stigmatism on everyone. But far right. too many people. Far too many people. And they don't care. Say about I mean, and that's about a good that's 85%. It, it must be some large percentage because it's far too rampant. And, I mean, if you don't believe me, all you need to do is log on Facebook. Log on Twitter. Log on things and see, you know, the, the actions of people. You know, the antics of people. Uh, it's it's not something I'm making up. It's right there in front of people. So you know. Now a question I want to ask you, man, is how did you turn away from the temptation of selling out? Yeah, it's just not who you are. You know, I mean, it's 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 you're not gonna <laughs> you're not gonna get me to put on you know high heels and a pink tutu. That's not cracking. That's not going on. We want you to play a we want you to play gay in this. I don't play gay. I don't do that. We're going to pay you $20 million to be gay. No, you're not. <laughs> I mean, it's just I that think simple. Kind of I mean, you know, it's, I, don't get me wrong. Yeah, I mean, you know, million dollars a lot of money, also, you know, but we're going to need to change this whole gay thing up. Cause, I mean, and Hollywood kills me with that. You look up and you got all these black men out here, and not just black men, but for me, to me, you know, black men would like to try and might want to try and you know steer away from such things, such you know that that kind of whole thing and, and being uh, you know made into some feminine feminine image. Don't allow that. So don't let any amount of money buy your integrity. Don't do that. You know you have to have respect for yourself, and that's in the end it comes down to that primarily respect. Self-respect, respect for yourself, treat people the way you would want to be treated, be cordial, be, you know, respectful. And, I mean, in the end, that's the big thing, you know. Cops don't respect us, we don't respect them back, you know. Uh, and uh, it, it's a, all of us are respect issue. You know, it, I think it, it started musically, respect. too. I think it also started musically, like in the '90s, when you start seeing guys go. I remember back then, where you know, if you went pop, they went for your head. Same way with Hammer, where he tried to come out with pumps and the bumps and some speedos. He was done after that. <laughs> well, you know, I mean, <laughs> I mean, I'll put it this way: Hey, if if you if your thing is a, and and you know, this is an I'm certain that when I said you're not going to pay me twenty dollars to play gay. I'm certain that you're going to have people who say, nigga, F that, that's 20 mil, I'm doing that shit. I mean, I'm just <laughs> acting, you know, I'm not really gay. That is your business, man, I'm not mad at you. But that is not how I wish to be portrayed. I don't want to be that. Why must I be that? Why did you make me the gay person? Make him the gay person. I want to be the gangster in it. You know, I want to be the businessman in it. I don't want to be, you know, the... The gay person, no, don't make me that. Why must I be that? You know, uh, right. and so I'm not really the person who wants you know get that twenty million money. Get your money. But see, that's what it became about. It became about the money, and people are doing anything for money. You know, people will steal from their mother for the love of money. I mean, people will. It's the money, man. And then, don't get me wrong. It, people always say that money is the root of all evil, and that's an untruth. Money is not the root of all evil. The love of money is the root of all evil. It's not the fact that, Absolutely. you know, it, it, it's not money that's doing it. We need money. We need whatever our, you know, uh, or whatever our, you know, common means of exchange is. Whatever your medium of exchange is, we need that. And it's particular case, it's money. So 
it isn't the fact that money is making me do it. It's what a person was is willing to do for money. Are you willing to kill for money? Me? No. Absolutely. Am I willing to go and am I willing to go and sell my body for money? No. So I mean, if you you know, it, it's about what a person is willing to do for money. How much do you desire to have this thing? And you know, at, at that point, it becomes about you and your integrity. What are you willing to do? Are you willing to sell out? No. Okay, well, we ain't gonna pay you. Very well. What's next? So I mean, you know, that's what stops you from doing it. Integrity. I think that's also the case where, considering that the landscape of the music business has changed so drastically that selling out looks look to be the only option. Like you know, the indies are pretty much getting chewed up to a degree, and a lot of cats, you know, coming in to coming in from the slums, they're like, well. I guess I got to put on these leggings and do what I got to do. But I wish you had hey. men back then, back then that, you know, would actually make a stand for their integrity. You, you know, know what? I'll put it to you this way. And you're very correct. You're right when they say, to some people, that they see that as their only way out. If you see that right. as your only way out, and, I mean, I, you just took the words, I have a song, my, probably my favorite song on this new album is a song called What You Got to Do. And it's, very much like that uh, it, You know a person is going to do whatever they got to do To come up Period Period. And mm-hmm. so I don't knock a person For doing whatever they got to do uh, It's just that you know Are you are you willing to You know go against your morals Go against your, your faith Whatever else it is I mean is money that strong Money is not for the desire for it Certainly maybe And often it's you know So it's it's it comes out. It comes down to that. But I'm gonna tell you something. I mean, you know, if you have faith in yourself, then you know, come up with a way to make your own money. Don't just run to you know these people who are handing out money and telling you, okay, I'm gonna give you a million dollars, but sign your life away. You know, I need you. I mean, you know, like what's called them fighting for the rights right now for the music. You know, you got people like you said that they're not gonna give that catalog up in the cash money. You know, um, situation. Right. When you get ready to sign a record deal, if that's what you get ready to do, don't just put your name on there. Get an attorney, read through that contract, and make sure that they say, okay, every day you come here, you're going to have to lick my balls. I mean, make sure you don't see that on there. You know, we're gonna, we, we need you to bend over when you come in. No. Read through the <laughs> contract, I mean, and, 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 I mean, and make sure that you make altercations. You know, I would be here every day, but the ball licking is not happening. The bending over is not happening. You know, make certain that you make your own way so that later on you don't have to worry about going to get a little to get your money back. You know, enough has been done in this business for people to have that kind of, you know, their eyes should be open now to making certain that your business is handled first. Because that's what this is, a music business. And, you know, these people out here are making money off of you. If somebody offers you a record deal, if somebody comes to you and says, I want to sign you, why do you think they're doing that? They want to sign you because they want to see you be a star. They want to sign you because they want to see you be a star and make them money. Right. So if they if they can make money off of you, then you can make money off of you. Whatever another person can do, you can do too. So, I mean, you know, you don't necessarily have to sign to anybody and put your stuff on iTunes and put your stuff on CD Baby and, you know, blah, 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 and Amazon and all that. If you want to go that route, that's your business. But here's my thing. The same way you have to get on a phone and go to iTunes or go to Amazon, they can go to uh, Eric.com and get your shit. Right. You did? You don't have to go there and get it. I don't, why, was, why do I have them going to you to buy my shit when I can have them buy my shit for me? They make all my money. I'm not paying you, you know, 50 cents on the dollar to, to, you know, to sell my shit for me. I know how to sell shit. They don't want, they're not buying iTunes, they're buying my stuff on iTunes. So, come on now. That's good and game that's right the reason why, Yeah, I mean, so, you know, people keep asking me, well, is your album going to be available on iTunes? Probably not. <laughs> I mean, if, if, if it is, I'll to figure out how to do that, but I'll be selling it directly for myself. <clears throat> the singles, yeah, I'll put them on iTunes and everywhere else because I wanted people to realize that it's coming, you know, that I'm coming back out. But... The, the meat of the sales, the meat and potatoes. No, I need that. I need that for my pockets. I do got enough money. 
Apple got enough money. Amazon got enough money. So, you know, it's it's really about you and it's about control. You be in control. Don't allow somebody else to be in control. You, I, I literally could not call myself boss unless I was that. Hey, if I'm not boss right of anything here. else, I'm boss of me. You know, so, hey, it comes down to that. Real. That's real talk right there. That's, that's some good game right there. You give it to the youngsters so that way they won't get caught up in these 360 deals and don't get caught all up. These exactly. Yeah, man, the publishing game is that's where it is. You know, I mean, you look on there and they say, you know, we we own your publishing, we own your masters. Yeah, we're gonna give you twenty thousand dollars per show. You know, but we're making money. We're gonna be making money off this album for the next twenty years. And we're going to put it on video games right now. Ballad of a is on, G- you know, Grand Theft Auto V. Uh, can I get paid for hey. that? Because y'all damn sure are. You know, so. Hey. But that's how it works out. It's a trap. And they have the means to do so. And then there you are like, yeah, you know, my song is on blah, blah, blah. Are you getting paid? Because you should be getting paid. That's your voice. That's your likeness. Get paid. That's why I- that's why dads went at them for using ambitions as a rider from Tupac. Yeah, man, get your money. Got to get that money, man. Speaking of which, how, you meet, how no. did you meet Tupac, and how did that song Picture Me Rolling come about? Met Tupac again by accident. We happened to be at uh, the BRE, it's a Black Radio Expo, and my manager, Michelle, and I, my princess, Michelle, we were in this ballroom and he had just done he had just done above the rim um and he had just done juice at that time and um so he came or was it above the rim one or two anyway when he came in the door we saw him but you know it was kind of dark in this room when he opened the doorway the light came in of whoever it was and it shone on him and it was it it looked like Tupac And he walked in the room And he started walking in our direction uh, And so we were looking at each other Going does it look like to you He's walking this way And she said yeah she said, well, Let's move over here So we moved When we moved he moved And kept walking towards us And we said no 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 Let's move back So we moved back and he moved again And he walked right up to me And he was like so I was like that I had no idea that Tupac knew who I was. Seriously. I mean, yeah, I had a couple of videos out, but you are Tupac. You're doing movies. I'm not at that level yet. You know what I mean? So for him to know who I was, but it, I guess it helps to be on NWA stuff. <laughs> so that was the first time I met him. And, you know, years went by, and I just happened to run into him one day in the studio for a second. He was in the studio with Snoop and them, Snoop, Nate, Rest in peace, and um, dads and, and corrupting, and they were all in, in, uh, at Can Am. And I just popped my head in and say, Hey. And when I did, he was sitting there. I didn't know he was there. And uh, he saw me, and I was just telling the homies, Hey, what's up? And he stood up and walked over to me and gave me a hug. And I was like, Man, that was, that was cool. We've only met once, and that was like a couple of years ago. But he was an extremely hospitable guy. And, you know, for him to, to be that cordial, I was like, Man, this guy is really cool. And, um, you know, another few years go by, and um, I got laid off from my job at this hospital, Martin Luther King Hospital, and I'm rolling, thinking to myself, you know, I don't like my life right now. You know, I'm signed to the biggest record company in the West, you know, arguably, uh, independent-wise at least, and they're not doing anything with me. I basically sit on the shelf, just lost my job. And while I'm thinking all that, a Tupac song comes on the radio. And then another one comes on, like back to back. And I'm sitting there going, wow, I wish I could do a song with him. And the very next day, I just out of the blue called the studio. And I said, you know, hey, who's in the studio? And they said, Pac. And I said, Pac, Tupac? And they said, yeah. I'm like, Pac is in jail. I said, you know, he's been here the whole weekend. But nobody knows. Should have got him out. I'm like, really? And so I'm thinking to myself, <clears> hmm, <throat> how many opportunities will you have to actually talk to this cat about a song? So I said, well, put him on the phone. And uh, he got on. 
And I said, what's up, Pocky? He said, what's up? Who's this? I said, CPO. He said, what's up, CPO? I said, I had a vision. He said, what was your vision? I said, do a song with Tupac. He said, uh, I do one with you if you do one with me. I said, cool, we got to do that. I'll do that. He said, nigga, I'm here now. And I was like, wow. I didn't expect him to say that. I thought he was like, all right, cool, get at it. You know, nigga, I'm here. Where you doing? And I was like, <laughs> Oh, well, uh, I said, okay, uh, all right, cool. He said, you coming? I said, yeah. He said, all right, I'll see you when you get here. And I grabbed a bottle of liquor, me and the homies had, grabbed a sack, and they were like, nigga, were you just talking to Tupac for real? I said, dude, the nigga said, come up here. We was out. And, you know, straight to the studio, did the song, and they were like, do you realize he just did the song with Tupac? And I said, dude, he's not going to use that song. I said, but it was really nice of him, you know, to let me come up there and boom, spend the day. And, uh, you know, it was really a cool thing for him to do because it took my mind off of, you know, my problems at the time. I didn't know he was going to really use every song he was doing. And then when I found out the song was on me, I was like, so? Nobody's going to hear it. Oops. So, you know, like I said, a lot of the things that I've done have been accidents. So it's a trip. That's, cra- that's crazy. Do you have any... Do yeah, you have, it really you have is. Any- I think we have uh, one last call. We got about 10 more minutes to go. Let's see who this is. we got in the 718 number. 718? Hey, yo, B. Oh, man. Yo, My partner in crime. <laughs> you know, I have to, um, you know, have a little cameo on here real quick. What's going on? How's everybody feeling? How you oh, doing, yeah, man? Chop it, up. chop it up with CPO with the boss hall. <laughs> Okay, that's what's up. What's going on, homie? How you feeling out there? I'm good, man. How you feeling? I'm tired as hell. I'm caving. I can't even fucking front. But, you know, I have yeah, to man. Show anyway. So what y'all that's was just talking it. about? What's going on? Bring me up oh, yeah. speed real quick. Well, we was chopping it up with, with CPO the boss about, you know, these weenies trying to become gang bangers, going through his, co- going through his career, talk about when he met Tupac and all this all this jazz tags. The good stuff. Nice. That's what's up. I always heard that dude Pop is a wild boy. <laughs> uh, yeah, man, I guess he was in the whole, uh, a little list and some of that, too, you know. I know one thing in the studio, he was a, a workaholic. I really appreciate The only other person I've seen with that kind of work ethic is probably Dr. Dre. But, yeah, man, Pop was, he was a workaholic. He was doing his thing. Mm. But it's a trip how, you know, you have to pretty much fight for your residue, residue money, man, especially when you're using songs and these labels be trying to trying to use it on video games and commercials and ads and the artists don't even get a piece of that. Right. And that's why I say you need to be careful about the contracts you sign up front because that's what's going to dictate all that. I mean, a person's not thinking about that, especially if you're a kid from the street. You know, you're not making real money or you, gotta, you don't have any job at all or you got a minimum job, or you just get out of school, whatever it is. You know, you broke. You need money. So you ain't tripping off of no, whatever this contract is saying. You know, yeah, it's got a thousand paragraphs. And that's another thing, too. You know, you got a thousand paragraphs. You ain't reading that. They get where the money at. Give me a check. That's all you're thinking. <laughs> exactly. And that's how you, know, you get them, young. That's how you get them. That is a, that is a that's diversion. It. You know, you need to watch what the left hand is doing. And that right hand is a check. That left hand is over here like this. Yeah, all in your pockets. You're not even knowing. It's taking everything you got. You know, so yeah, you're all gonna right. get this twenty thousand or fifty or hundred thousand up front, but on the end, on the back end, they get super paid. They get you know. they get millions off your blood and sweat and tears. Absolutely, because they're not telling you we're getting ready to take a step and sell it over in Europe and China and you know Taiwan and everywhere else on the planet, and uh, you know. And you just signed it, that thing that they saying we can. And we don't have to give you none of that to sign that, too. What? <laughs> yeah, you did it. Thanks, though. We appreciate it. <laughs> well, mm. you know. That's robbery without a gun and a knife. Right, man. I mean, it's not even robbery. You walked in and gave it to them. Here. Legal in my robbery. Ass, <laughs> yeah. What you signed on that dollar? Legal robbery. robbery. <laughs> I started to get yeah, on these young dudes nowadays because, you know, them young dudes ain't trying to read nothing. 
they just like fuck that. I'm trying to show a label, and I'm going to be rich by the by, you know the next day or a couple of weeks. They don't mm-hmm. understand that shit comes with very like a lot of hard work and dedication. Yes, it does. Yes, sir. That's very true. And, but but that's the dream they sell you. You know, and, and it's a trip because I mean, you know, they put your name up in life. You on stage. You got uh, women from you know here to you know from Compton to Maine. And, you know, it's like you you, you live in larger, you, you know, you big limousines and pool parties, and this is my life. Yeah, okay. <laughs> you know, it, it, yeah, that's going to end at some point, dog. Now, we need something that's, so, you know, it's time for a new album, and you really think you're living on top of the world. I swear, they have you thinking that way. It's a game to them. But it's your life they're playing with. You know what I mean? So... And unfortunately, you know, the majority of people don't figure it out until it's too late. You know, and then they find themselves trying to get a lawyer, a lawyer they can't afford, because they didn't spend all their money on stupid shit. I bought 90 cars. Did you? Yeah. <laughs> you know. <laughs> no. And they think, I mean, oh, when, when, I'm going to get the money back once I drop this album. Like, motherfucker, that album ain't just popping like that. So you're not going to make, <laughs> make that money back. That's no, got to recoup. Not. And man, they have to recoup. Let's see. And I mean, well, let me tell you. And it's they may as well be sitting there in front of you with a cash register. Well, let's see. You had seven, uh, 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 seven glasses of champagne, cha ching. You bought everybody else in the place a round of uh, champagne, cha ching. Uh, you had nine parties this week, cha ching. <laughs> everything, every single solitary thing that is not being. I mean, that's being people, given to you. They're going to get it back and some. Outfit. You want you and your man. Man. Outfit, man. Oh, oh, my God. Dude, Dude please Georgia. don't say that again. <laughs> please don't say that again. Do you realize yeah. every time I went to shop, I took my homies with me? And don't get me wrong, I was there was my niggas. You know, nigga, we finna go. We finna go get some shoes. And we going to get some outfits. We, we my ass. <laughs> you know, and you doing it for every woman that's on the team. Baby, baby, don't even trip, boo-boo. I got that. I got your rent. I got that. Woo, you killing me. Because you're rich. No, you're not. You know, it's it's a, it's a an illusion. It's an illusion, you know. I mean, and, and, and unless, of course, it's actually real, and in most cases, it's not. That's real game so, right you know, there, But, yeah, man, we're about to shut up the shop, though, bro, because, you know, we we running on that time. You got any shout-outs you want to give out? Uh, yeah, I want to give a shout out to my homegirl, C Note. Uh, you know, I want her to hurry up and do an album. My homegirl, Boss, I want her to hurry up and do her album. And uh, I wish I could, uh, uh, my, 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 uh, my boy, uh, Chill, who just touched down, and, you know, I need him to hurry up and get some things cracking. Uh, you guys are going to love his stuff. My brother, Bokulo. My daughter, Mickey, having. They didn't hear you call in, but whatever. But, uh, yeah, man, that's pretty much it for me. And I uh, thank you again for having me on the show, Eric. I really appreciate that. Man, there's no problem, right. man. We would definitely like to have you as a future guest again. No problem at all. And tell Lady J, I really love a lot of her commentary. She was giving some really nice answers to uh, uh, some really nice, you know, commentary of what you guys are talking about. Uh, too bad I didn't get to chop it up with her, but maybe next time. Oh, yeah, definitely, man. It definitely will be a part two to the scenario. Yeah. Cool. So, yeah, you take it All right, gentlemen, you guys. Appreciate yeah. that, we appreciate everybody that took time to chop it up with us. So we out. Indeed. Peace out. What the fuck good?